Hi and welcome back to a new video. Today we will talk about the Intel VCA2, which is an extension card I purchased, I think on eBay Mexico. So it had quite a long journey and it's also something I have not seen before, at least on YouTube. So it could be quite interesting. The VCA2 stands for Intel Visual Compute Accelerator. And I think the name is quite self-explaining, but we can also turn the box around and on the back side you can read that this is a PCIe extension card that contains three Intel Xeon CPUs with 64 gigabyte each, so a total of 192 gigabyte per card. But let's just straight take a look inside the box. And what I find kind of fascinating is the fact that for whatever reason Intel spend some time on giving this a nice packaging even though this is like an enterprise server product so that's quite strange. So the goal for today's video will be to take it apart completely to look inside because that's also something I have not seen before. Also couldn't find any kind of like teardown online so pretty interesting I guess what we can find underneath the chassis of this thing and then also we will try to install it in a system which could be quite difficult, especially considering that it's almost impossible to find some of the tools which are required to get this card to run. The Intel VCA is a very obscure product because it first looks like a graphics card, but it's definitely not because we have three CPUs in there. And at the same time, it's also not like a compute element, which you can like easily access over Windows, for example. But it's more like having three systems inside a different system. So yeah, very interesting approach. It is still a PCI Express device, but it's also quite a bit different. Already looking at a PCI Express slot. First of all, the like hinge at the end is missing, what you would have on a normal graphics card. And also if you pay attention to the pins, we only have one pin that's a bit shorter on the back. That is the ID pin to identify that this is a PCI Express times 16 device. But on here, we have multiple ID pins. So that one would indicate that it's actually a times one device. This would indicate times four, this times eight, and this times 16. So that's already quite unusual. If we look at the IO area, you can see there is no IO. So like no HDMI or display port or something similar. Also no connectors from this side. Only at the back we can find power connectors, one PCI Express six pin and one eight pin connector. The backplate is also a bit unusual because typically if you would have components that are sitting higher than the rest and would maybe collide with the backplate, you would either elevate the backplate or just do cutouts. But on here the cutouts are also filled with some like protective film underneath. So just looking underneath here for example, we have a capacitor sitting underneath and then some like foil, foil above to protect I guess the components from any kind of short circuits. The thing above here is essentially just a cover, so you can easily remove that and underneath we can now spot some memory slots, like notebook memory, but these are actually ECC notebook memory DIMMs and they are 8 GB capacity per DIMM. They're also not included, so I bought them and already inserted these inside the slot. And on the left we can see the Intel Visual Compute Accelerator 2 reading, also that it's listing Intel Xeon processor E3V5 and Iris Pro 4K Ultra HD. And the reason why they listed 4K on the product itself was because the focus of the VCA2 was video encoding. And that is also the reason why they placed these very specific Intel Xeons in there. Those are E3 1585LV5. Thanks for the naming Intel. And the thing is, these CPUs can be compared to let's say Skylake Desktop 6700. They're kind of similar, like Skylake Desktop. And what sets them apart from a typical Xeon CPU is the fact that they also have iGPUs. And that is more the reason why they were using these CPUs, because this is, as I said before, meant for video encoding, for example. And that's why those iGPUs are very important on there. The CPUs are 4 core 8 thread CPUs with a TDP of 45 watt. So it's not exactly like the 6700, but it's kind of like a maybe 6700T kind of comparable. Interesting fact also, there are not only three CPUs on there, but also three chipsets. At least that's what I could find in the specs. I didn't tear anything apart yet, but that's what we will do now. First of all, we will just remove the cover and then maybe find a cooling solution underneath. That is one interesting cooling solution. Cannot remember that I've seen anything like this before. So very interesting, obviously, because it's supposed to sit inside a server. It will just have air cooling going through here 
an exit through the back. The documentation also states that you could use it the other way around, but I think the main cooling purpose was that air would enter here, go through all these fins and exit right here. I'm not sure how many cooling blocks they are, like dedicated cooling blocks. Could be two or three, but I think I have to take it apart further. We'll also remove the memory dims now. I first thought I could simply take out the one on top, but then I realized that they are kind of stacked above each other. That's why we first have to remove the heat pipe in the center. Before I removed this heat pipe, I wasn't even sure if those CPUs would use heat spatters or not. But as you can see, it kind of reminds me of just a normal notebook cooler. It just makes contact with this like tiny cooling block and then two fin stacks on each end. The second heatsink to remove should be for the CPU on the left, simply because you can see one more heatsink will go underneath the heatsink on the right. So we first have to remove that one and then straight the one for the CPU on the right. It is just insane. It is just completely insane. It looks like a triple GPU card. It kind of is though, but it's also a triple CPU card. And also when I earlier pointed out that it contains three chipsets, that were, that's something we can already kind of see because the like long die contains the CPU and also the iGPU obviously, and the chip next to it should be the chipset. What I also noticed is that, well, we have, first of all, an additional like cooling plate for probably cooling the VRMs, which is connected to the backplate. So I will have to remove the backplate to take this off. And then this thing around here seems to be something like an ILM, because typically on a notebook, you would have these types of screws and some springs to it, while we don't have any springs here. And this is like a socket, like an ILM, because you can see those are like yeah, mechanical springs and they are responsible for mounting pressure. And underneath the backplate, we can actually find chipsets, which also means that I was wrong when I was first talking about that this would be CPU and iGPU and this would be the chipset. It is still true that this is the CPU with iGPU, but the chip right here, that is an additional memory chip, 128 megabyte of like additional cache. While removing the backplate, the ILMs also fell off. It's a pretty interesting design though. Now after the CPUs are clean, that is a very, very impressive and very interesting view with these uh, three CPUs. So each CPU has two memory slots, which are directly connected to the CPU. Each CPU can be accessed over the PCI Express bus. That's why these should also be PCI Express bridge chips, like PLX chips. Still have to clean them from this bluish stuff, which should be like a liquid thermal pad. Those are typically used also on here, like for making contact with the VRMs and like additional parts that require cooling. And when these materials are applied, they're kind of liquid and then they harden over time, which turns it basically into a thermal pad. So I will clean off the stuff from here. Then we will check out what kind of chips these are. But the chip right next to here, this is an Altera Max V. Should be a CPLD, like a complex programmable logic device pretty much a simple FPGA. After cleaning off the TIM, as expected, those are PLX PCI Express bridge chips. The one is an 8749 and that is an 8717. Both are basically doing exactly the same, so they can split up PCI Express lanes into multiple hosts. So for example, they can split the times 16 slot into three times x8. That's why I'm also not quite sure why they used two of them, because the 8717 is basically exactly the same product as this one, just on a tinier scale. I think this one is like 10 or 12 port hub or like 16 lanes. So yeah, I'm not quite sure why they had to use two of them. Also, there's an M.2 slot right next to it. And looking at the rest of the components, it's not that spectacular. We just have a bunch of VRMs, this lane for this CPU, another lane for the second CPU and a third row for the third CPU. I'm now reassembling the VCA2, adding some new thermal paste and then we will try to somehow, I don't know, if we can get this thing to work, to detect, whatever, we will try. I plugged the VCA to this Intel-based system. I decided to go with Intel simply because of the iGPU, because as you can see, the monitor is attached with HDMI to the 12900K. 
which just makes sense because we will need the full 16 PCIe lanes of this card. And if we would plug a dedicated GPU in here, then we would miss some PCI Express lanes if we would plug this in here. If I move this one to the primary slot, like if I keep it in here and just plug a dedicated GPU in here, I noticed that the board will be stuck at VGA detection. So that kind of solution did not work. That's why I decided to go for the iGPU solution and that seems to work out just fine. The device manager straight detected the VCA2 as PCI device. So the first three of them seem to be the VCA2. Then I downloaded the only driver that is available on the Intel website and at least it's listing some VCA Windows drivers. So we'll just try to install these. After installing the drivers, I can see the Intel VCA PCIe device listed, but you can also see something seems to be wrong. So if I want to check what's going on, like what is the status, it tells me that the device could not be started. Not quite sure why that's the case. I tried a lot of things meanwhile to get the VCA2 to run. It's a bit more difficult than I thought. Obviously, the first thought would be that something would be wrong in addressing the PCI Express slot. So for example, on ASUS BIOS, you have this above 4G decoding option, but that seems not to be the problem because all three like CPUs or devices are detected correctly in the device manager. That would not be the case if, for example, would be wrong with the above 4G decoding. That's something you might know from like Bitcoin mining. If you have multiple devices hooked up to a, uh, to a single PCI Express slot, then you have to basically split it up. But that seems to be working correctly. But then after looking through the entire documentation of the VCA2, I also spotted that there are supposed to be two different utilities. One is called the VCA CTL, like VCA control utility. And what they're stating in the document is that you should use the control utility, which is included, but like I didn't have any software included and there's also nothing I can find online. And then there is also a virtual network controller or like a virtual network like utility because the first VCA was also equipped with an Ethernet cable. So you could control it over network, which is not the case on this one anymore. Like the VCA2, you have to simulate a network. And this is also a utility I just cannot find anywhere online. I also contacted my Intel contact in Germany, but he didn't find anything over the last two weeks. So yeah, I'm just trying it this way. Maybe somebody of you knows somebody or you know something or you have the utility maybe then it would be uh, quite awesome to get it. There's one more thing I quickly want to add at the end after talking to some of my guys on my Discord server. They figured out because they are way more into like enterprise solutions and server hardware. They figured out that apparently you can only install Windows on the device itself. Not sure how exactly that's going to work out. And for the host system, you would have to use Linux. So I'm not sure if that's maybe the problem. But then on the other hand, I'm asking myself, why do these Windows driver exist where you can like install this in Windows? It's pretty strange. They also found this VCA CTL tool, but only for Linux and not for Windows. So not sure. But if anybody out there has more information and maybe different tools for Windows or has more information how to use these cards, then feel free to let me know. All right. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye.